Well, good evening. We have the privilege once again of uh, turning our attention to communion, to the Lord's Supper. And tonight I want to turn to a very familiar passage, uh, 1 Corinthians 11. We look at this passage nearly every time. Down to verse 23. very familiar text to us again. What, but what impressed me most about these verses this time is the phrase, in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. We see that repeated in verse 24 and 25. And what impressed me from these two statements, we can see really the desire of our Lord to rem be remembered by His people. And knowing His people as He does, <clears throat> He knows how badly we need this reminder <laughs> of Himself in the taking of this bread and drinking of the cup. And also knowing his people as he knows us, he knows how fickle and how forgetful uh, we tend to be. And he, he's our creator, he knows our personalities, how short of attention span, memory span we have of certain things. And so I believe as a result, he instituted this simple ordinance and then he explained the purpose. Do this in remembrance of me. And from that time on to today, his redeemed people have gathered in his name alone <clears throat> and in scriptural simplicity have sought to carry out this request of our Lord. And this is a very special invitation to us from the Lord himself, from the host himself. We're not hearing about him, we're hearing from him to gather in his presence together, to remember him, to pour out our hearts in wonder and worship and consider the beauty of who he is, his excellency and just the glory of our Savior. So the sole purpose of this Lord's Supper is to provide us an opportunity to concentrate our mind's attention and our heart's affection on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ to the exclusion of everything else. And so as we consider the bread and the cup, I'll offer you just a few things we can remember about our Lord. I just love the providence of God in bringing Greg to this text in John tonight. We can consider his love. We just heard a great exposition of the love of Christ toward his disciples. Love is a verb. It's things he does for us. And so you can certainly contemplate that. We can also think about his name. Psalm 20, verse 7. You don't need to turn all these passages. I'll just read them off. We read in Psalm 20, verse 7, Some boast in chariots and some in horses, but we will boast in the name of the Lord our God. So concentration on the names of the Lord is just bound to produce worship in his people. Matthew 1, 21, we see an angel of the Lord <clears throat> declared to Joseph and to Mary, he will bear a son and you shall call it, she will bear a son and you will call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. In Isaiah 9, 6, we read, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Think of him as the Christ, the anointed one of God, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And he's the, the full display of all God's divine attributes. He's the everlasting word. He's the Father's only son. A couple hundred years plus ago, John Newton wrote a hymn, How Sweet the Name of Jesus Sounds in a Believer's Ear. It soothes the sorrow, his sorrow, heals his wounds, and drives away his fear. Dear name, the rock on which we build, our shield and hiding place, our never-failing treasury filled with boundless stores of grace. Jesus, our Savior, shepherd, friend, our prophet, priest, and king. Our Lord, our life, our way, our end. Accept the praise we bring. Till then we would thy love proclaim with every fleeting breath, and triumph in that blessed name which quells the power of death. As we concentrate on his name and all that it reveals to us of his infinite worth and superb loveliness, worship can't help but follow. Another way to remember him would be to remember his awesome works. When we think of his works in creation. In Colossians 1, 16 tells us that by him all things were created, 
both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He's the creator of everything we see, everything we have. And we can also think of his works in salvation. John 4, 34, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me to accomplish his work. And in such passages as, Matthew, as Mark chapter 10, Jesus was even more explicit, saying in verses 33 and 34, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, they will spit on him, and will scourge him and kill him. And three days later, he will rise again. And then in verse 45, Jesus declared to his disciples, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And so as we contemplate his marvelous works, his work as the creator and his work and the redemption of his people, worship can't help but follow. And just one more thought, and there are many more. Consider Jesus as our great high priest. Romans chapter 8, verse 34 tells us that Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised and who is at the right hand of the Father who also intercedes for us. And Hebrews 7, 25 says, Therefore he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So we can draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, as the author of Hebrews told us. Because he is our great high priest. So we can consider his names, we can consider his love, we can consider his works. And that's what we ought to be giving our attention to as we come to this period of, of, of our service, to do this, what we're going to do in remembrance of him, which will begin here in just a few moments. We'll have an opportunity to do that. But for those who are visiting here, I just want to remind or, or let you know that here at Ankle Bible Church, we practice open communion means this bread and this cup are for all who have placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. And we'll have to be a member of Anchor Bible Church to participate with us. Welcome to do that. But if you've not trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, in the precious blood of Christ on the cross, we ask you to just not partake with us. This, this would have no meaning for you, but rather consider your position before the God of the universe and your great need for salvation. We have tables set up across the middle of the room which contain the bread and the cup. We'll take a few moments now to consider Jesus and then we'll come back together after you've gathered the cup and the bread. We'll come back together and, and partake together. <laughs> 